Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Debbie Gatte. I'm Vice President of Strategy and Programs at the Philanthropy Roundtable, and I am pinch hitting today for our wonderful program director, Erica Haynes. Erica focuses on workforce development and is really the brains behind this wonderful event that we're putting forward today. Um, and I, I hope you all get to meet her in the future. Now, thank you all members of our community and the public for joining us today. We're grateful for your support uh, for the roundtable. And the work we do here really is made possible by your investments and the commitment of all of our partners. So we thank you. Now, as many of you know, and some of you may be new to us, the Philanthropy Roundtable works to build and sustain a vibrant American philanthropic movement that strengthens our free society. And one of the main ways that we do that is by finding and highlighting direct service, nonprofits that are doing the hard work on the ground of advancing liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility in communities across America. And when it comes to workforce development, we support the work of philanthropists who are committed to equipping people with, the, with mobility through work. And our work focuses on entrepreneurship and skills development programming, alternative credentialing methods, and apprenticeship models. Uh, we are looking to support people to help them achieve economic independence and security. This work aligns really well with one of our key pillars over here at the Roundtable, which is strong communities. We believe that is essential for a free society. So entrepreneurship is at the core of this work, and it's never too early to start cultivating an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, teaching K-12 students the value of personal responsibility is directly tied to creating opportunity for great life outcomes. We know that an entrepreneurial mindset is critical to preparing youth to own their success as they move through life, but it is not often a part of core curricula in schools, as you know. So thankfully, there are programs that focus on this core skill, and these programs are trying to reach more youth with this empowering mindset. Scaling these effective program models and interventions really is hard work, it's not easy. And it is something that most organizations have approached in many different ways. We are thrilled to share some insights on why youth entrepreneurship programs matter and what lessons can be learned from scaling these models. Our panelists today are on the ground and they work very hard. They're, gonna, they're going to share the successes and the challenges of their work. They're gonna provide a perspective on what the barriers are that many organizations are facing. Really thrilled and uh, pleased to welcome three high impact organizations that have very different approaches and models. Uh, I've, we've got with us today, Kylie Stupka, president and CEO of Youth Entrepreneurs, Ayeli Shakur, executive director of Build, and Nicole Mason, executive director of Lemonade Day. I'm so glad that they're here to join us. I'm going to have a conversation with each of our panelists first for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to move to audience Q&A. So uh, you all know how this works by now. There is a Q&A box at the bottom. Please do put your questions along the way in that box. That way, if something comes up that we can address during the conversation, we will. Otherwise, we will uh, talk to all three of our panelists in the Q&A and get through as many of those questions as we can. So. Um, with that, let's get started, and I'd love to welcome Kylie Stuka uh, to our virtual stage. Hi, Kylie. Hello. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I am. I am quite well. It's great to see you again. It's great to see you too, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in real life sometime, somewhere soon. So Hopefully, in the time Zoom it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Kylie, um, first I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself and about youth entrepreneurs, your work, and your organization. What's your core mission, and what drives you? Yeah. So, gosh, that's a loaded question, right? Um, there's there's so much that, that has that led me to this organization. I started in my my professional career as a CPA and worked very diligently with nonprofit organizations, trying to help them better understand how they could really thrive within their mission, but not mission themselves out of business, right? And so understanding how it was important to be sure to understand value creation and markets and, and kind of all of these things that are that are super imperative to entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial mindset was exactly what I was trying to help nonprofits do. In so doing, it brought me to this lovely organization, Youth Entrepreneurs, that's been around for 30 years. We started in 1991. 
And we started as a nifty affiliate. For those of you familiar with the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, we were a network affiliate. affiliate it's back. your 30th anniversary. It is. It it's is. ours too at the round table. Well, Congratulations. Happy anniversary, right? You too, <laughs> we have you too. Perfect. Um, yeah, so we've been around a while and, and you know, um, really kind of working with this organization, I found that this brought together my passion of kind of understanding business, understanding entrepreneurship, and also understanding how it was that nonprofits really do need to, to, to behave um, so, as, so that they can create value. That's how I kind of ended up over here. So um, the, in a nutshell, that's that's me running Youth Entrepreneurs, and I've been here now for 14 years. In fact, celebrating another anniversary one week ago, September 17th, we'll celebrate my 14th. Congratulations. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm coming to you live from Wichita, Kansas, which is not necessarily the first thing that pops into people's mind when they think of the entrepreneurial success stories, although we can we claim fame to Rent-A-Center and Textron and uh, Seth and, you know, um, Pizza Hut, just, so, you know, we do have our claims to fame here. So we've got a, a real nice entrepreneurial spirit here in, the, here in Wichita, Kansas. But a little bit more about youth entrepreneurs. First of all, something I think that, um, you know, might be a surprise is that we've really changed the way that we are articulating our value proposition. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, we've also changed our name. So youth entrepreneurs has become what is now known as of March 31st as empowered. So I'll tell you why we've, we've done this, Debbie. So it's imperative to the, to the point that you made earlier, that in order for us to have students that understand how it is that they can critically think through and solve problems for any organization that they work for, despite whether it's something that they are developing and creating on their own, or an opportunity for them to develop and create within the walls of someone else's business, it's imperative that they understand just some simple principles about markets some simple principles about creating value. And it's imperative that those students are exposed to a teacher that understands those principles as well. And what we found was over the years, the teachers were embracing just as much as our students, the ideas of entrepreneurship. They were really kind of taking them and positioning themselves as entrepreneurs. What we saw was systemic change within education systems, allowing for classrooms to be managed in a whole different mental way, allowing for them to leverage entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So we developed these resources for teachers, yet our name, Youth Entrepreneurs, suggested that we were specifically going to develop out resources for youth directly to youth. And it really did confuse this issue around, hey, gosh, you know what? If, if we are thinking entrepreneurially about, about the way we approach our classrooms, we can really make instrumental change within these systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, Youth Entrepreneurs became empowered in March, and we are available now with a very robust entrepreneurship curriculum that still is there to help students kind of get have a pathway to, to, to trajectory for problem solving. So we've got that, but we also have this ability for teachers to understand incentives, purpose, agency, the relevance behind what it is they're introducing to their students to think entrepreneurially about how they manage their classrooms so that we've got an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial propensity that goes well beyond a classroom that goes well beyond the system really trying to impact these systematic changes. So Empowered is um, kind of taking on this ability to uplift the social entrepreneur educator through the resources that we've seen students embrace, um, very experiential, hands-on resources. Students have embraced it, and as a result, 30% of our students were starting businesses. Others were elevating themselves within the businesses they were in. These types of things are what happens when you embrace this mindset. So why am I excited and passionate about yeah. this? We've got a whole, we've got a whole ocean, ocean to boil, right, Debbie? Right, you do. You got a lot of empowering to do. So um, thank you for explaining why the transition and what the thinking was behind that. I think that's very useful for people who knew the organization as youth entrepreneurs now empowered. Um, so Kylie, thank you for that. And it's clear you're very passionate about, about the work. So now, Tommy, there are endless challenges to working in communities. Um, as you know, you've been doing this for 14 years now, right? So um, why are you interested in youth entrepreneurship when it comes to actually improving communities? Tell us more about that connection. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, I think, I think we've got, um, we're, we're coming upon a, a real pivotal moment in the trajectory of our society in that, um, you know, the, the argument is our students are not being prepared to, to really kind of understand, they, they're, they're not given a 3D education that allows for them to discover their innate abilities, to develop around those abilities, and then to apply them in the real world, right? That is the definition in my mind of entrepreneurship, this ability to take agency of agency, ownership, right? If entrepreneurship is ownership, agency over your trajectory or your pathway is so incredibly imperative, despite what is whatever the obstacle is that you're trying to overcome. And our education system has become a little less focused on this ability to uplift the agency and the individual, this individualized education that allows for students to better understand how they create value in society. And if you don't understand how to create value in society, you see a problem as a problem. But if you understand how to create value in society, you see a problem as an opportunity. Yeah. So it's an important they, these students need to see, they need to see the vacant lot across the, 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 the street from their school not as a, an eyesore or a problem. In fact, we've got a vacant lot activity that does exactly this with all of our students. It has an opportunity to create value for the community that they love. I think I once witnessed that vacant lot exercise, actually. You <laughs> probably so, did. I probably yes. did. So, um, so my, my last question for you before we turn to some of our, our other panelists is, so now um, help me make the link between youth entrepreneurship and workforce development. I think I see where you're headed with that based on your answers so far. Um, make the connection between youth entrepreneurship as an area that people are investing in and workforce development, self-sufficiency. What's the link from your point of view? Well, you know, I'm going to give you just a, a, a real kind of cold heart example, and that is the state of Montana. We've partnered with the state of Montana with their chamber to um, they have a goal of economic development mm -hmm. for their state. They're a rural state that really has so much opportunity that's unseen and untapped because, again, of this kind of mental model or point of view around what is an opportunity and what is an actual kind of problem, right? Those types of things. And in so doing, when they've embraced the youth entrepreneurs curriculum, and they've been able to introduce it to the teachers across their state, we've seen things like you know, um, rural communities erecting um, drive-in theaters where Garth Brooks plays his COVID, you know, so it, we've seen communities come together and understand what it is that they have there within their, their kind of within their grasp that they can create value around. We see them start to create businesses. We see them start to help businesses create solutions. We see them develop out economically with jobs, with um, new ways of creating solutions. We've, we've just, Montana has embraced our ideas and together we're partnering and seeing some amazing things happening in that state. There's a true, absolute connection to this ability to see a problem, turn it into an opportunity and create a solution that has everything to do with creating jobs, that has everything to do with putting people back into the space of positive, the glass half full mentality. And there's, there's just really no other way without thinking about, um, you know, this, this, this real positive entrepreneurial mindset, no other way to increase economic mobility within a community with, if you don't have that risk taking mentality. Yeah, no, I think entrepreneurial mindset, it sounds like it's at the core of what you do. And that makes a lot of sense. It's a mindset that the student takes from program to various um, future stages of life. And so that connection is pretty clear. All right, Kylie, well, thank you so much um, for sharing your work at Empowered. And I'm going to ask you to turn your camera and mic off. We'll see you back for Q&A with, with everyone. And I'm going to ask, yeah, we'll see you in a few minutes. And I'm going to ask Ayeli to join us. Um, Ayeli is with Build. Hi, Ayeli. Welcome. And yes, we'll get you to unmute. Okay, here's my microphone. Okay. Hi, Debbie. Great to be here. Great to see you. Okay, so um, we just heard from Kylie at Empowered, and Build is a different organization. So let me start with my initial question for Kylie and ask you the same question. So tell me about yourself and how it is that you became involved in this work. Tell me about Build and what makes you excited. 
Absolutely. Well, there are quite a few parallels to youth entrepreneurs, the program that Kylie just described, and I love the name change uh, as well. So Bills was actually founded in 1999, so we're about 21 years old, um, and we use entrepreneurship to really inspire engage young, and engage young people and to help them build career success, entrepreneurial mindsets, and opportunities. So that's actually an acronym. So we, we like to say we're helping young people become the CEO of their own lives. Um, our program actually started um, as a dropout prevention program right at the height of the dropout crisis. Uh, we started out with a young, uh, young people in East Palo Alto um, and right across the train tracks, you had Palo Alto at the height of the dot-com boom. Um, it was really thriving and sort of the land of milk and honey and you could just see the economic disparities on the other side of the train tracks with the young people in East Palo Alto. But by teaching them the skills of entrepreneurship, empowering them to start a real business with real profits that they get to keep, those young people became incredibly inspired, incredibly re-engaged in their academics and went on to not only graduate high school on time, but also go on to graduate from college. So from the very beginning of our history, We've always been at that intersection of entrepreneurship, high school graduation, and college and career success. Uh, today, we're serving um, over 15,000 students um, through a combination of our in-person programming that we do in schools, uh, where we go into schools and actually teach build as an elective course during the school day, also training teachers similar to the model that Kylie uses. And then we've also started uh, going digital and the digital model really has accelerated our growth over the past year and a half. So our hub regions are Boston, New York, uh, still in uh, the Bay Area, in Oakland and the peninsula and Washington DC. And we now have satellite programs that are springing up all over. So we're in Los Angeles, uh, we are going to Memphis and Pittsburgh, we're in Tucson and Phoenix. So really trying to evangelize entrepreneurship and bring entrepreneurship education to middle and high schools all across the country. Now, those are some very different regions when you- They really that. are, yeah, yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and that's a lot of CEOs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you very are. exciting. Ayeli, what about you personally? Is there anything you wanna add about how you how you came to this work? Yes, you know, um, I, I really started my career as a classroom teacher, started teaching out in Compton, California, and then continued teaching in Boston. And one of the things I could see in all of my young people is that um, there's incredible power in student engagement. When you can get that, that light of inspiration to come on for our young people, they're unstoppable. Um, and yet our traditional classrooms are, you know, basically still teaching an industrial age education and many of our students are bored. They don't see the connection between what's going on in the real world and in their daily lives and what's happening in the classroom. So I was just really passionate about entrepreneurship as a way to connect the dots to for our young people between their daily lives and the real world and really help them see, wow, I might need those math classes to help me figure out profit and loss. And I need those writing skills to write my business plan and those communication skills to communicate more effectively. So that was a major piece for me really around student engagement. The second piece for me though was around bridging communities. And you know, as someone who grew up in the black community in Boston, uh, what's interesting about the way that Boston and Cambridge, which is the neighboring town where Harvard is, those towns are connected by the number 10 bus that was sort of riding right through our neighborhood into Kendall Square in Cambridge. And I thought, you know, if we could really connect thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem that you see downtown and over by Harvard with what's happening in the Black and Latino community and really connect those dots and bridge those communities together, that that would be a really powerful experience for our young people, helping them see all of the things that are possible for them in our corporate sector, in industry, really helping them realize they belong both in their classrooms, on the basketball court, and in the boardrooms in downtown Boston and Kendall Square, but also bringing the corporate community and the business community into our neighborhoods to see the incredible brilliance and creativity of all of our young people. So that's one of the things I think the build does really well with our mentoring and our business coaches and all sorts of other volunteer opportunities is really bridging communities and helping everyone to learn from each other. Wow, that's so, and I love this visual that you just described of the number 10 bus 
running in both directions. I mean, we needed right? to run in both directions. Yeah, you need to, to run in both dots. directions. That is, yes, that is a, great, a great image to, to hold on to. So I would like to talk more about communities, right? Because there are endless challenges, right? Yes. In, in the communities. And we just, we, we heard the various communities that Build is in, it's quite a range, right? So um, mm-hmm. why are you, why do you think youth entrepreneurship is a key way to help with communities. And, and you said a little bit about this, but I'd love to hear more because there yes, are yes, you know, right? In the Black community, entrepreneurship is not a nice to have, it's a survival skill. And those are really foundational skills that all of our young people need in order to thrive, um, in order to have economic mobility, in order to um, really be able to realize the American dream, if you will. And yet those skills are not taught in our traditional classrooms. As Kylie said, you know, we're, we still are sort of teaching these rudimentary skills that don't really equip our young people with that sense of ownership and self-agency and self-direction. Um, and we're also not giving them those skills to be able to create and invent and reinvent themselves. And I think if there's one thing we learned during the pandemic, it's that we have to build adaptable citizens uh, because nothing, you know, we cannot predict the future. We've all learned that the hard way over this past year and a half, right? And there's a there's a famous saying, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And we know that it was those who were nimble and adaptable that were able to make it through the incredible upheaval of the pandemic. Those are the types of skills that you learn through entrepreneurship. And that's why I think it's so foundational um, for all of our young people to develop those skills and not for it to be an elective course but really a foundational course where it's almost as important as geometry and the other courses that are currently taught in our high schools. Okay. Okay. Ayala, you made a great case for why it's, this is not an optional thing. This it is really actually is a, a required necessary CEO of your life approach um, that you want to see every child get um, that training and that, that thinking, that mindset. So I'm curious You've been working in lots of different parts of the country, right? Where, where for you, do you see the gaps, right? Where are the gaps in the programming? Where are the gaps in the training? What do we need to do more of? Right, right. Well, you know, I think there, there are definitely gaps. Um, there, first of all, there are amazing entrepreneurship programs all across the country. Uh, some of them local, others that are national programs. Um, And I think one of the gaps is really just bringing all of the entrepreneurship programs together and really starting to shift the narrative around youth entrepreneurship. Many people, when they hear about entrepreneurship, they're thinking, oh, it's just about students starting a business. It's like an after-school activity, again, a nice to have, not a must have. Um, And we need to shift that narrative and help people understand Through the entrepreneurial experience, we're teaching critical 21st century skills and social and emotional skills. In BUILD, we're specifically teaching communication, collaboration, problem solving, innovation, grit, and self-management. And when people understand that those are, again, those 21st century skills all of our employers are looking for, those are the skills that help to predict success in college and career and in life, uh, why wouldn't we want more of that in our school system? And so really trying to shift the narrative from, you know, again, entrepreneurship being an optional piece to being a really core and central course. We're actually sparking a national campaign called Building Gen E. It's all about building a next generation of entrepreneurial leaders and change makers. And we're really trying to form that entrepreneurship alliance to get all of the other organizations that do use some entrepreneurship really focused on, you know, building that Gen E together. Um, that's the generation that we need that's going to help to future proof our young people and bring us um, into the next. I love it. So it's Gen E of CEOs. Building Gen E. Of CEOs who are empowered. There is definitely a theme here, even though our, your programs are slightly different and maybe focused in different places. So Ayali, thank you so much for sharing that. We're going to have more thank from you, you um, in the Q&A, but thank you for that. I'm going to ask you to turn your camera and mic off and ask Nicole to join me. Um, and Nicole, welcome. Hello. Hi. So you are with Lemonade Day. Correct. Correct. Okay. So it's not obvious by my attire. <laughs> oh, it is obvious from your attire. <laughs> and I'm appreciating, I'm appreciating the link. Um, so Nicole, 
share a little bit about Lemonade Day. What, what is it? What do you do there? And what brought you to the space? What makes you passionate about it? Oh, well, obviously by my attire, I am very passionate about talking about this. So uh, I've been in the nonprofit space for almost 20 years from arts and culture to health and human services and now in youth development. And my roles have focused on fundraising and marketing and strategic partnerships. And coming from a, a family of entrepreneurs, it is very much deep in our genes. Uh, I'm a first college generation graduate. And so coming from that environment, I deeply believe in what Ayeli and Kylie have shared about what it does to inspire that spirit and really set you on the right path. And coming from that family, it has been an amazing honor to join Lemonade Day as our CEO. Uh, and together with our board, we are really committed to preparing youth for life by infusing character education, entrepreneurship, and life skills building into this amazing program that's more than just about the limits. It is really, it's our vehicle. Uh, Lemonade Day was founded in 2007 by a Houston philanthropist and entrepreneur, Michael Holthouse, who was really inspired by his own personal journey. And when he realized his own children uh, were not introduced to these vital concepts that have been shared. And that's what inspired Lemonade Day to teach kids how to start, own, and operate their own business by way of a Lemonade Day stand. And that is something people all around the world can relate to. And we pair our kids with mentors and over a series of customized programs, whether it's six or eight weeks, three, six, 12 months, we are able to deliver this lesson-based curriculum uh, to kids all across the country. We are licensed in 80 plus cities in Canada and Bermuda with interest from other countries. And our program operates independently by way of license holders in each of these communities. And our little lemmies go through a step-by-step -step process of running their own business. And much like what Ayeli and Kylie have shared, the objective is to help today's youth become the business leaders, the social advocates, the social entrepreneurs like us ladies sitting here today and the, the forward thinking citizens of tomorrow. So really, it is not just about the lemons. Uh, it is entrepreneurship as a vehicle to, to building the self-esteem and these new mindsets that really propel our youth to succeed in ways that they otherwise would not have pursued. And to be able to do that, we align with academic institutions, religious institutions, economic and community development organizations, housing providers, the range is deep in terms of accessing youth and caring adults so that we can deliver this program where we target K through eighth, eighth grade. And that way we can create this beautiful feeder system uh, to, uh, to programs such as uh, Ayeli's and Kylie's where we have this beautiful ecosystem from K all the way through 12th grade and for those who are college bound, beautiful. But for those who aren't college bound, we are equally equipping them with those vital skills to, to succeed in life. So, so now I, I wake up seeing yellow and lemons and my personal journey is definitely driven uh, by my passion in this space, which is why I'm so excited to be with you today. You are definitely making lemonade, Nicole. So, um, <laughs> so let, let me ask you the same question I asked um, the other ladies, which is about the communities, because you mentioned that you're in 80 communities, 80, 80 cities, um, in three different countries. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about why this, and why do you think this is helping to solve challenges in the communities that you're in? Because they're all very different, right? So why is youth entrepreneurship so critical to actually helping a community? Uh, well, I am very biased about this and that is because as I am new to Lemonade Day. I'm actually celebrating my four month anniversary. Congratulations. I, thank you. Uh, but I'm not new to this space. Mm. I spent the last 12 years as vice president of fund development and communications for a nonprofit in Houston, Texas called New Hope Housing that develops low-income affordable housing uh, and wraps supportive services around residents coming out of homelessness. And so I have seen 
firsthand families and individuals that have been entrenched in deep generational poverty and domestic violence and trauma. And what that does in terms of setting the, their course in life. And so it didn't take much for me to realize that I wanted to be on the other side of that equation. While our affordable housing and homeless service organizations are amazing, sadly, they are handicapped because they are charged with addressing a problem that is quite difficult when you think about the deep systemic changes that are needed to address generational poverty. And so it wasn't too difficult for me to think about being on the other side of that equation to prevent the problem, to be able to equip our kiddos with the right skills that can then prevent some of the other more negative aspects that sadly um, a lot of our marginalized communities see, which is not graduating from high school, unstable housing, unstable employment. And I mean, just the data around the, the number of families are in our country, I think it's more than a third that don't even have $400 in their bank account to be able to handle an emergency. Right. That more than a third cannot afford housing or food and I don't even want to start about the number who are, don't have health insurance. And so when you think about programs like this, they really need to start at a young age. Some folks kind of question why we start at, in the K through, uh, in the K space, uh, kindergarten space. Sadly, studies show that if you're not introducing these components, these uh, financial skills to kids by the age of nine, their trajectory in life is exponentially more difficult in terms of having a healthy relationship and healthy understanding of financials and being freed from that burden. And, and so it's, it's easy for me to sell something that I deeply believe and have a lot of experience in seeing what happens if we don't yeah. do this. And that's the big problem. If yeah. we don't do what we're talking about today, I know firsthand what we're, what we're going to have to address. And it's, it, it, it won't be pretty, nor is, it, nor is it sustainable in the way that we have it. So I find this to be a much more sustainable solution. Okay. And maybe we'll need less housing, affordable housing and homeless services at the end of the day. Yes. Okay. So Nicole, um, you are echoing what we heard from Ayali and Kylie about this is really essential stuff, right? So um, help me make the connection because K is a long way from workforce development, yep. right? And people do, we almost have these two systems of we work with K through 12 and then we have workforce development. How do you make the connection between what you're doing at Lemonade Day and that future workforce development? How do you think of that connection? Oh, it's very deep and critical. Most workforce programs are not introduced until the, the age of high school. And a lot of them are very adult centered. You do not see workforce programs that are targeting the kids. And the problem is, is just the narrative around that, especially after high school, workforce programs end up being used to address a problem that someone did not have the right skills to maintain their job. They are coming out of jail, prison, or just other, a variety of other social issues that it shifts the way that it's able to impact. And if, again, if we're planting that seed at an early age and we're setting their path right, they are much more equipped to then be successful business owners. And again, it's much more just beyond being a business owner. It is, as Ayala and Kylie already said, it is about them having those skills to succeed and to thrive in life, to dare to dream and to know that they can be brave and what being brave really means and how that helps you navigate aspects of your life outside of school and work. Just thinking about your personal relationship, meeting someone on the street. You can just, all of those varying character building skills are all offshoots of entrepreneurship type minded programs. And we gotta start early. You gotta start early, right? You, so, can't, change, you can't change the system if you wait too long. That's, that's right. Thank you for making that very explicit and very clear, Nicole. <laughs> All right, so thank you. I'm going to ask Ayeli and Kylie to join me for some Q&A, and I'm going to remind our audience to actually um, make sure you drop your, your questions um, for all three ladies in our Q&A box. And I've got one that I'm, I'm kind of curious about the answers here. So one of, the, um, one of the criticisms sometimes people have about programs like this 
is that you have these young people come and they experience this amazing program. They come away with a new sense of um, inspiration, empowerment, and they come away thinking like a CEO ready to make the lemonade, right? Um, and then they return back to their communities where they are around people who are struggling. How do you all help make sure that what happens in the program stays with the young people who are participating in these programs and then has an effect on the community because you can see them going back to their home environment and you know, being put back in a place that may not be as encouraging as your programs were. So I'm curious what you think of that. And Kylie, I'll start with you. Yeah, so, um, you know, we try to ensure that the, the youth entrepreneurs family feels as if they're a part of, of something much greater than a class in school or the, the connection to the teacher is so incredibly strong. So we've got, you know, a lot of social pages where they continue to connect with one another. Our teachers continue to connect with them beyond the classroom. Um, we've got the investors in the program that that want to put the, the students that they've invested in to work, right? So we've created a community and the community is really there to support one another. This teacher community is imperative because the, the burnout in the, in the kind of system is so incredibly high and the, this inability to really kind of feel like you can have agency in your career is, is certainly a barrier. So it's important that they have a community, but then this community then for the, the students that they reach, once they learn from their community that matriculates then down to their students and they, they keep this. So we like to think of anybody who's come through what used to be a youth entrepreneurs class now comes through a class with an empowered educator has feel, thinks of themselves as an, as an alumni of something much more special and beyond a simple class. And what we do see is that when we do pour into the educator, that educator is reaching 126 students a year on average, 3,000 in their lifetime. So that kind of connection and that, that real bond, I've got a, a, an alum who actually went through the class well before me, who is a current donor, who is absolutely enamored by what we've been able to do with him, Vietnamese immigrant, would not be where he is today had he not been exposed to the ideas, knew he had something special in him, that he runs a group that, that continues to keep all of our, to keep our, our, our alum and grad and teachers together. So we know that we've got to create this movement and continue to fight the fight. So that, that's our best effort. Um, we can't necessarily go into the homes of all the, the students, but we certainly hope that what they're doing is taking the ideas from the classroom and from their amazing empowered teachers home with them. And, and I, we do see a lot of that as well. So the teacher is someone that, you know, remains with the student even after the program is gone and then the community that they can, they can interact with and stay engaged with. Uh, thanks, Kylie. So Ayeli, I'm actually still picturing this number 10 bus right? <laughs> going in both directions. And one mm -hmm. of the things that, that you explain is that the bus is going in, in both directions. So, or you're trying to help that bus go in both directions. So I'm curious your answer to the same question. Sure. Yeah. Right. You know, one of the beauties of the build model is that we're with our students for a total of four years. So they will start that ninth grade program in their schools as an actual school-based elective. Um, shows up on the report card and so forth. But then for the remaining years in build, they're in the community. Um, so they're coming to a community center, they can be at a boys and girls club. Sometimes it's after school at their school. Sometimes it is um, at an actual adult incubator. It's also in community. So we've been using the Roxbury Innovation Center, which is an actual accelerator for adults and they create space for our young builders uh, to come and work on their um, products, on their businesses. And so that's one way is to bring the students, keep them in their community so that they can see they can actually be entrepreneurs and be the CEOs and VPs of marketing and so forth right in their community without having to leave. But we wanted to go one step further than that because what we saw is that we were training young people up in entrepreneurship, sending many of them, you know, graduating high school on time, going off to college. Um, but not necessarily knowing how to use their entrepreneurial mindset and skills to make a difference in their community, in their neighborhoods. So we wanted to make that piece much more explicit. In addition now to regular entrepreneurship, traditional entrepreneurship, we have a focus on social entrepreneurship and civic engagement. So now we're explicitly teaching those skills, helping students make that pivot. So you can not only make a profit, but you can now make a difference. 
and really helping them to see how they can use those entrepreneurial skills, um, again, to be much more proactive in making their community a better place. Their communities are full of assets and full of wealth that is very often not necessarily measurable by traditional means, but helping them tap into the strengths of the community and figure out those entrepreneurial and innovative ways to really make the community a better place. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Ayeli. Um, and Nicole, how do you help make sure that the kids continue to drink the lemonade once they're <laughs> once they're once they're home? I'm so glad you asked this question because it takes us out of of, of just being seen as a, just a, a lesson based program and really sets it in the context of the greater community. And and for Lemonade Day, the the three pillars of our program are to spend some, save some, and share some. So to Ayeli's point, that philanthropic impact and knowing how to make a donation that takes it outside of charity but creates lasting change for their community is critical. So it engages our kiddos to be able to study what's going on in their community, help identify a problem, and to be able to be res responsible stewards of the fund so that they're taught how to save money and what that can set them up for in terms of access to college and stable housing and things of that nature, all the way to being able to drive change by sharing some with their community. And since mentorship is such a critical component of our program, of course, pie in the sky, the ideal is uh, the, uh, that we're having our parents be the mentors. But we also have to recognize in our underserved communities, many of our parents are working two, three jobs and are single parents and aren't, that's not, that's not necessarily an option for them, but still mentorship is critical. So there's a, a, there is a caring adult that is walking step-by-step hand-in-hand with our kids. And a lot of it can also be corporate volunteers mm -hmm. because of the curriculum and the way that we, uh, that we deliver our program, kids have to actually seek investments. So that puts them in a position of going into one of our banking partners and their establishments and seeking an investment. And I'll share just a little story about what that does to, to inspire the entire family. For many of our lem little lemmies, they are then bringing their parent into that environment where many of these parents have never stepped foot into a bank. They have never understood what it means to balance a checkbook. And you are having kids teaching their parents about, oh, I need to go find an investor. And you're introducing these things that become more beyond just the child. And what you're doing is you're also building trust in your community. With these Lemonade Day stands, it is positioning you to understand your geography, to understand your community and engage with your neighbors. And living in Houston, enduring a whole lot more of floods than we would care to admit. But between Hurricane Harvey and the winter freeze, that is a perfect example of what happens when you can build trust with your community and your neighbors and what you can do to come together. And Lemonade Day offers that in terms of that community-wide program where you're, you're getting to know your community and it takes you out of that individualism that sadly COVID has unfortunately brought too many people to, even though I hoped it was going to bring people the other way. Uh, so we're, we're trying to take folks out of that individual mentality and create community. All yeah. by Lemonade Day stand. We have been put into bubbles, that is for sure. <laughs> Very sure. Um, so we're actually at the end of our time and believe it or not. And so uh, one person asked, and I think this is a great way to end is they're clearly excited about what they're hearing. And they're asking, can all three programs collaborate? So I'm gonna leave the three of you with that with that to think about and take away as being you know, something that the, the audience is Can I just with. say one very brief thing to that That's very point? The, the minute after we had our call about this panel, I get emails from the staff of Ayeli and Kylie wanting to talk about ways that we can create this beautiful feeder system with our programs. And I have already visited with Kylie's staff and I visit Ayeli with your staff next week. So oh, it's, already it's, it's, happening. Happening. it's already happening. It's already happening. Well, 
that yeah. is that is what we the why at the round table we think it's important to have these kinds of events because um you are all doing incredibly important work it's an opportunity not just for us to help share that but also for all of you to have a conversation with each other and we're that really makes our, our day to hear um that those conversations have already been happening behind the scenes so my takeaway from this is probably, I'm probably having more fun with this than I should, but it, we've got empowered CEOs making lemonade and I'm just excited about the whole thing um, and can't wait to follow the work that all of your organizations are doing. And we will try to help make sure we're telling that story. Um, and with that, I mean, if you're listening and, and this is the kind of thing you would like to learn more about, if you go to our website, you can sign up for our roundtable roundup which is where we list what events are coming up and, and we share the stories of organizations that we are working with. So feel free to sign up for that. Um, thank you, Nicole, Ayeli, mm -hmm. and Kylie for visiting with Such us today. Such a pleasure. It was fun. Such a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Take bye care. Bye. Thank you.